Unless we diversify the voices and the people that get an opportunity to become entrepreneurs, we're never going to have ideas that really address the full demographics of the country. Jen, thanks for joining us here today. When people think about Rent the Runway, who don't know your business, they think about fashion, they think about you know, clothing women, but you were really running a massive logistics company. Would you talk a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes to enable you to get clothes to people around the country? You know, if you think about traditional e-commerce, their businesses are based around outbound logistics. How quickly could I get the item to the customer? When it comes to a rental business, your focus has to be on inbound logistics. So how quickly can I get something back from a customer, restore it to perfect condition in order to send it out to the next customer? Now, when you're renting clothes as opposed to renting out, let's say, physical DVDs like Netflix did in the beginning of their business, there's a lot of um, abnormalities that can happen. Someone can spill a glass of red wine, a hem can rip, something can come back in poor condition. You can't take something through an automated process. You have to triage when you get it back to your warehouse, and therefore we've had to vertically integrate and run the world's largest dry cleaning operation out of our warehouse. Describe what the inside of uh, the dry cleaning or warehouse looks like. I often describe it as being like a Willy Wonka land of fashion. There's clothing that's just going robotically on trolleys everywhere. And for people who love clothes, you go into the warehouse and you're like, this feeling of reckless abandon, like, I'll take that. I love this. What's actually happening is thousands of people are taking it through a process of receiving the inventory really early in the morning understanding what we have to do to restore it to perfect condition. So most of the clothing in our warehouse is actually turned around with a zero-day turnaround time, meaning same day. When you started this 10 years ago, did you expect to be this deeply knowledgeable and involved in logistics, in IP of, of fabric, of cleaning? I thought we were going to outsource our logistics and outsource our technology. Right now, if you think about our logistics and technology teams, it's 90% of our employees. So the very things I thought that we were going to outsource are both the core competencies of the business as well as the barriers to entry. I mean, at the very beginning of the company, we were the ones packing out the orders every single day. We were the ones putting something through a dry cleaning process. I was at every single designer appointment. Now that it's 10 years later and we have an incredible team, I'm far less in the weeds that I was before, but I think a great leader knows when to flex the altitude. So they know when to stay up at 100,000 feet and focus on the vision and the strategy, and for which two to three really, really important things every year that you go down to that one foot level. What are you doing to increase your distribution? We are launching a national partnership with WeWork, where in WeWork lobbies across the country are going to have Rent the Runway drop boxes, where our subscribers can take back the clothing they've already worn, drop it up in the Dropbox, and then immediately on their app, choose the next items they want and receive them either same day or the next day. So it really expedites how quickly you're going to be able to turn around the clothing you have. And therefore, the average subscriber can go from using us 120 days of the year to potentially 150 or 175. Because how we think about this business over time is that the only metric that really matters is usage. If you're going to change consumer behavior, you're more likely to do that if she's using you more of the days of the year. So how many days of a year, on average, does a subscriber use the service now? So right now, she's using us 120, which is remarkable. It's pretty high, yeah. Because if you think about other things that we do all the time, you know, for instance, the average American buys a cup of coffee 85 days of the year. So the fact that two and a half years after we launched this subscription, that our customers are already using us 120 days of the year is a signifier to all of us that they were really ready to put their closets in the cloud. And by opening up more distribution, what do you expect that to get to? I would like it to get to, over time, 250, 300 days of the year. Your goal is your closet is basically empty except rent the runway rentals that you have filling it up for and is changing all the time. 
I think that your closet should be filled with some investment pieces that you can wear over and over again that provide almost the canvas to what your Rent the Runway subscription is doing. So you should own a black cashmere sweater and you can wear it with a new skirt from Rent the Runway every single day or a new pair of pants. People should be thinking about their clothing purchases as investment pieces and at, in terms of cost per wear. The industry over the last 30 years has moved away from that and in fact, close to 85% of the purchases in this $2.4 trillion industry are kind of one-time use or two-time use purchases. So we go into a store with the intention of, I'm going to buy this quick fix. It's something that I want right now. It's an impulse purchase. It fulfills a trend. I assume the same day delivery push is a way to still enable that kind of sugar high without actually having to crash. Exactly. Rent the Runway, we think, is a more sustainable way to get that emotional high of self-expression. One of the things that you have really become known for is having your own really strong voice beyond just being the voice of the company. You've taken up many industry causes. How do you balance the two? Well, I think over the last few years in particular, I've had less confidence in being able to rely on government and Washington to make the right moral decision on behalf of the American public. At the same time, Rent the Runway has scaled dramatically over the last few years. So suddenly you get out of your bubble and you realize, wait, there's 1,500 people and their families that work for me today. That number is likely going to be double next year and Lord knows what it'll be a few years from now. I have a responsibility that's just beyond making money. So I started to think about the inequity that exists in business that I had been part of perpetuating for the first, you know, chapter of Rent the Runway. And that inequity was treating and compensating our hourly and our salaried employees differently, meaning that we had a different set of benefits that we gave to our salary employees that were more generous. I began to question why that was. And the only reason I had is that we had copied what other best-in-class companies did. Right. And that I'd never spent the time thinking about the implications of my own actions. It's still relatively early, but have you has it changed retention numbers at your company? We are starting to see that it's changing retention. It's certainly changing the day-to-day -day culture within the warehouse. Someone was going to quit because her daughter was having a C-section. And, and she was the she only was one just, Her plan was just to, just to quit because she couldn't ask for a leave and that was not going to be an option. That, that changed her, her work with you. It changed her work, but it also changed the mentality of all of the women that she, she was on our seamstress team, she still is, all of the women that she works with every single day who clearly knew that her daughter was going to have a C-section as well now know that they can go through and celebrate life events or deal with difficult times and Rent the Runway is going to support them through those times. What makes you decide that you want to spend your time and your voice calling out those things? There's a recognition I have that the very best founders, the very best ideas come from people who have personally experienced a problem. Right now, we have a set of entrepreneurs who represent the wealthy in this country, who represent people who went to Ivy League schools, who grew up in educated backgrounds, who had every opportunity given to them. I'm one of those people, and I created Rent the Runway. And I'm not claiming that Rent the Runway is addressing the ills of society, because it's not. I was not equipped as a founder to address the ills of society because I haven't experienced them. So unless we diversify the voices and the people that get an opportunity to become entrepreneurs, we're never going to have ideas that really address the full demographics of the country. The lack of female entrepreneurs is certainly a massive problem. I mean, only 2% of dollars are going to women, so clearly it's a problem. But it's also a problem that we're not funding entrepreneurs of different races, of different ethnicities, people who come from the middle of the country, people who come from poorer backgrounds. Why do you feel like it's important for, for you to spend your time talking about If I'm not going to speak up, who will? What's the point of my life if not to have a voice and try to change the world for good? I mean, it's egregious right now how few women there are in leadership positions, not just across business, in government, in all areas of society. I mean, is it 2018? It's ridiculous. 
And that's also the case for all underrepresented groups. We just have to speak up so that the world can change. What do you think your peers should be doing? More entrepreneurs should certainly be speaking up about missions that are authentically important to them. Mm -hmm. That's not that everyone has to stand for every issue, but there are things that an entrepreneur can uniquely stand for, that their company can uniquely stand for, and their voice is an important part of our national conversation. A little bit over a year ago, you went on CNBC and talked about your experience being sexually harassed by one of your investors or a would-be investor. In the time that that has passed, have you been surprised by any changes or the lack of changes that have happened in the, in the year since you came out with it? I think that there is a massively big and positive movement that's happening in the entrepreneurial community that's represented by organizations like All Raise coming together with this recognition that it is harder for female founders and entrepreneurs. Now, there's a lot of reasons. It's not just related to sexual harassment. I think that that's the easiest one to identify. But there's a massive amount of gender discrimination. It's harder for women to hire. It's harder for women to get the amount of capital they need early on. Now, we have seen a lot of hiring in VCs over the last year where all male firms are starting to hire their first female partner. Right. That's great. But... We know and data proves that having one woman in the room or having one person of color in the room doesn't change the conversation. You need to have a plurality of voices in order for that woman to be able to make a difference. I think that it's a great first step, but we need to encourage these firms to diversify even further. And it can't really be done soon enough. Just yesterday, uh, Kirsten Green at Forerunner announced that she raised a $360 million fund. This is a woman who has had some of the greatest successes in venture capital over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Between her investments in Jet and Warby Parker and Glossier and a whole host of companies, many of which, like Dollar Shave Club, have been acquired or have had great exits. She raised this $360 million fund. I saw an announcement yesterday that an associate from Greylock or Sequoia raised a $500 million fund. The associate didn't have the track record that Kirsten and her partner, Yuri, has, has certainly not had the success, has certainly not had the voice. Why is it that one of the most successful women in the industry is raising this much and some effectively, and this guy may be very smart and very talented, but kind of a no-name guy is able to raise a $500 million fund right out of the gate because we're giving him a chance. She has to work so hard to prove that she's worthy of the multi-billion dollar fund. Another guy can just say, hey, I'm here. And suddenly they have a lot more money to play with. And we all know that when you have more money to put to work, there's a higher probability of success because you have more opportunities to fail. Typically, when women have children, 40% of women are dropping out of the workforce right. today. We've never had a woman drop out of Rent the Runway post having a child. Is that right? 100% 100% of women retention they... of Incredible. women after having kids. Uh, I'd love to end with some career advice. You must get a million girls and women, young people coming to you saying, how do I become like you? What, what kind of advice do you give people? I think the first thing is to just go for it. I have had a um, confidence throughout my life, not that Rent the Runway was going to be successful, but a confidence that even if it wasn't, even if the worst possible scenario happened, that that worst possible scenario isn't that bad. I think that people often catastrophize a situation and they believe that some call it fear of failure, but it's really feeling like your life ends at that point. Right. But the reality is that people have a lot more resilience than they give themselves credit for, and that we have to be aggressive in going after our dreams in our lives. And that's just not your dream for your career. It's your dream for your family life. It's your dream for the type of you know, social life you want to lead. If you're not aggressive about, about that dream, it's never going to happen.